The gut is because this baby has no money. What else are we looking at? Obesity. Mm -hmm. Okay, what do you think about? It's a little more than a Okay, so you pull it back a little bit. What else? Mm -hmm. What kind of line do you think this is? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, it goes in right here. This is a loop on the outside. This is the insertion side. It goes straight up, but it goes into the liver and it stops it. Okay? So you can't, um, if it's a UAC, it's going to go down. But you look at the insertion side, you find the end, here's the end, follow it back, and here's the insertion side right here. This is the unlock. Okay, so it goes straight up. If it were UAC, we would follow the line back down this way. This is on the outside. This is the insertion side. But it went into one of the small vessels in the liver and just kind of crawled. Um, if you needed to use this for an emergency, you would pull it back to about right here and use it to infuse um, IV fluids and get drugs if you needed to. Okay? But just remember that it's just, the vein is just underneath the skin, at the very top of the skin. It can come out very easily and it can bleed dramatically. So you have to make sure it's secured very well. Okay, if you have a low, if you use a low line, you can see. In the resuscitation, you can, in the delivery room or on transport, you can always put a UTC in very easily. The, the orifice is dilates very well. It, it's almost always dilated, so you don't have to try to dilate it with a forceps or anything like that. Um, and you can put a sterile catheter in and put it in until you withdraw blood. In a baby less than a kilo, it only has to go in two, three, four centimeters. In a baby that's three kilos, it may have to go in five centimeters. You want to use a low line line to do a resuscitation. That way, you know you don't wait. You don't need to wait for an X-ray. You just put it in until you get blood. You don't want to go more than five centimeters. If it's a bigger baby, three to four centimeters. If it's a smaller baby, you get blood. You use that to give you drugs. You can access that in less than 60 seconds. And if you have a baby that needs instant resuscitation, it's often much easier to put the UVC in than it is to try to start an IV. Okay? So that's something that, that some people don't often think about. But if it's a newborn less than three or four days of age, it's very easy to access the UVC and the umbilical vein. We would have to pull this catheter out and try to insert it in. We don't routinely leave a low line UVC in place. You use it for emergency procedures and then you withdraw it. If you need the UVC again, you have to insert another line. Okay. Now, what did I just say about pneumonias um, and babies being homogenous? All except one type of pneumonia. Staph aureus pneumonia. This is classic for Staph aureus pneumonia. It doesn't have to be in the right or the low. What differentiates Staph aureus pneumonia is the fact that you see these little pneumatocils right here. That is classic. Those are cavitation, areas of cavitation within the lung itself. That is classic for Staph aureus pneumonia. And oftentimes they're visible on the chest x ray before the baby symptom happens. And we've had babies that we got a chest x-ray because it was starting to develop some respiratory distress. And this is what you see. And think, oh my goodness, he's got stuff always in mind. We better start doing blood filters and put him on vancomycin and the help it and, and do that. But oftentimes this, this happens. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at the rest of his x-ray. What else do you see? Right. He's severely rotated. Okay. Doesn't have any type of lines in. Got plenty of air. Yeah. Yeah. This is BPD. Partial pulmonary dysplasia. It's not called BPD by many people now. It's usually called chronic lung disease. There's a new BPD and an old BPD. So in order, we just 
just call everything chronic lung disease, you know, so you don't have to say he's got the old BPD, he's got the new BPD. One of these days we'll, we'll go into the difference between old BPD and new BPD, but right now we're just going to call it chronic lung disease because it all essentially means the same thing. They have the same course and that type of thing. See this hazy, coarse material up in here? See how it's coarse and white? Fibrotic. Fibrotic. That's it, exactly. And look at the diaphragms. Is it nice and rounded? No. no. See how flat that diaphragm is? And look at his lungs. See how they almost bulge at the lateral aspects? It's hyperexpanded. It's hyper expanded because you have the coarse fibrotic area throughout the lungs. And then the alveoli that are functioning have air in them and they're over, they get so over distended that they cause atelectasis on the other alveoli. So you have fibrosis, a mixture of fibrosis and atelectasis in the lungs. And that's why it's, these babies are very difficult to manage. Again, this is a severe BPD baby again. What about our tube placement? If it was dead, we'd turn it back and let me do it. Right, if it were midline. Are there, are there heads midline oftentimes when you do chest x ray? If there's not a nurse there at the bed to help the chest x ray, is the tech going to turn his head in midline? No, they're not supposed to touch the bed. So if the nurse is not right there to help, then um, the bed may not be midline, the baby may not be positioned correctly. Look at this coarse, white and filled face throughout the whole lung. Look how hyper expanded. Even his heart is squished. Look how small the heart is. If the heart's squished, what what type of out cardiac output is he gonna have? Mm -hmm. Right. They'll have diminished cardiac output. Their blood pressure may uh, decrease. They may, you know, they may have decreased urine output because you have such little output and diminished blood pressure. Okay, so we're going to look at some more things. What do you see on this X-ray? A little bit of atelectasis. We're getting atelectasis. Okay. Now let's look at our position. Pretty straight, mm -hmm. not too rotated, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Look at the ET2 position. Looks okay to me. How about you all? Mm -hmm. Okay. How about NG2? Go into the stomach. Go into the stomach. Always look if it's got an NG2 in, always make sure it goes to the stomach. We've got x rays where it goes to the lungs, or we've got x rays where it stops near the esophagus. You're feeding him or giving him fluid, metasophagus, and what's going to happen? Reflux. Mm -hmm. He's going to aspirate. He's going to have bradycardia. And we're going to think that he's got some type of terrible disease process when it's really atherogenic. You know, our tooth is just not in good position. How about his, this tooth, UAC? It's kind of It is a good time. We could, we'll probably leave it there. Um, T8 is optimal, but it can be T7. Now, this is complete right-sided atelectasis, right? Mm -hmm. Totally consolidated. Where's his heart? It's all over there. Right. It's moved to the right side. Now, why would his heart move to the right side? Because that lung is collapsed. That lung is collapsed. It shifts up. It shifts up where the lung is collapsed. So, what happens when you have a new thorax? It pushes it to the opposite side. Right, pushes it to the opposite side. So, whenever you look at this x ray, chest x ray, you look at the position of the heart and that type of thing. And you see, this is atelectasis. With atelectasis, the heart shifts to the side that atelectasis occurs. With an air leak and then with thorax, the heart shifts to the opposite side because it just physically pushes it over, it pushes the meniscus down and over. Okay, 